hi everyone, welcome to uh, to our first meetup on Air Meet. Um, we're gonna see how this goes. Um, it's uh, a <laughs> definitely a different, different new platform, uh, and it's got some some quirks. So uh, thanks for being our guinea pigs. Jamie, right. I'll share the slides. Sure, go for it. Excellent. Thank you, John. So, um, okay, we did our networking in Airmute, <laughs> and now it's announcements time. And we're gonna have some presentations, and then we'll socialize some more. If you'd be so kind, John. <laughs> um, okay, yeah, so soon we're gonna have some lightning talks. Uh, as a reminder, um, we might be hearing from Ian uh, Finley about uh, migration for beginners. Uh, there's a chance he's not gonna make it tonight. Um, then we're gonna hear uh, from Hussein Abbas about quickly scaffolding your Drupal websites for experimentation and development. Uh, and then from John Pugh about DevShop Composer components, tools for testing, and DevOps. And then Amy June Hinline is going to talk about accessibility as a moving target. And Gaurav Mishra is going to talk about API developer portals. And then uh, Mauricio Donarte is going to talk about converting a static site into a dynamic React.js application. And finally, um, our scheduled lineup, I'm going to talk about automatically building and deploying from GitHub to Pantheon using GitHub Actions. Um, and we might have time for an impromptu lightning talk. So. If there's anybody out there who's uh, considering uh, or might, might be interested in giving a quick 10 minute or less lightning talk, uh, there will probably be some time. So think about that. Okay. John, you gonna move me along here? Thank you, sir. Okay. John should be up here because he's operating the slide deck, but. <laughs> Amazing, <laughs> Amazing, Leonard. Um, so, um, so amazing, JD Leonard. So, yeah, so, uh, you know, the organizers um, who, who put this on, uh, all, of, all of what we do is based on the great work of uh, past organizers and the Drupal NYC board. Uh, and if you're interested in helping organize our meetups, we'd love to have you. Um, hop on Drupal NYC Slack and join the meetup dash organize channel. And you can find us on Twitter at Drupal NYC. And uh, that's the link for hopping on Slack, drupalnyc.org slash Slack. We'll have the link to join. Uh, and we encourage everybody to support the Drupal Association. Um, like us, they're a nonprofit supporting Drupal. Um, however, they are the nonprofit supporting Drupal. And they do a lot, particularly around providing Drupal infrastructure uh, for drupal.org um, and lots of other stuff related to the Drupal project. So uh, yes, I see some some reactions, some blue heart reactions, good. <laughs> um, so definitely uh, consider becoming a member. Uh, it really doesn't, it doesn't cost much to, to be a member. Um, and it's a good way of showing your support. Okay, upcoming events. So we've got um, Bay Area Drupal Camp, Bad Camp, October 14 to 17. And um, then there's New England Drupal Camp. They're doing a boff only camp, of birds of a feather. Uh, quick little discussions, and that's November 6th. And then uh, Drupal Camp NYC, uh, the first one for a few years now is uh, November 13, oh, this is wrong. It's November 12 to 14. We've extended it by a day. So this slide is wrong. Um, and then uh, DrupalCon Europe, December 8 to 11. And you can always find more upcoming events at drupalcal.com and groups.drupal.org slash events. There's also a new one, um, drupal.org slash uh, community slash events um, that has a bunch of uh, Drupal events on it as well. So check that out. <clears throat> Speaking of Drupal Camp NYC uh, 2020, um, it is actually November 12 and 14. Got it here. <laughs> it's a virtual camp. And on the, this is missing Thursday though, on the Thursday we're gonna have a whole bunch of trainings. Um, so look for more information about that. We haven't announced the trainings yet, but we do have them lined up and we've got some really exciting trainings. 
Uh, and then on Friday, uh, we're going to have, uh, we think, three tracks of content. There are going to be some traditional sessions uh, that are uh, New York themed. And uh, we're going to have some boffs, uh, discussion groups. And then we're going to have some other fun interactive activities, networking, kind of the hallway track that um, you might be missing if you've attended previous Drupal camps. Uh, and then on the Saturday, we're going to have some more trainings uh, in the morning. And we're also going to have a full uh, day of contributions. Um, and so definitely plan to be there. Uh, great opportunity for anybody to contribute to the Drupal project. Uh, you don't have to be a coder. And you don't have to have contributed before. Um, so if you're interested in getting involved, uh, check out, uh, you can email us at you know, camp volunteer drupalnycorg If you want to sponsor, camp sponsor drupalnycorg and definitely check out our website, DrupalCamp.nyc. Sorry. All good. OK, so speaking of Drupal Camp sessions, so we are seeking a few uniquely New York sessions. Um, and we are, we are only reaching out kind of within the Drupal community, so we're or the, the New York City community. So that's why you're hearing about this here at the meetup. Uh, you'll hear about it uh, on Slack, um, but we're not doing a general call for sessions. Um, so maybe you've worked on a, an iconic New York project uh, for a you know, New York institution with a connection to Drupal, um, something that is in some way New York. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, email camp-session at drupalnyc.org, or you can stick around for our post-meetup networking and, and talk about it uh, with the organizers there. And uh, missing from this slide is that we are seeking uh, to have all proposals in uh, by noon uh, this coming Tuesday. So there's not long, um, but if you have a, a New york -y session that you'd like to give, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, and if you're interested in speaking at our meetups, uh, you can talk for any length, within reason. <laughs> uh, and you can uh, you know, talk on a topic uh, beginner level, advanced, uh, it doesn't even have to be directly related to Drupal, as long as it's of interest uh, to the Drupal community. And as long as it's not uh, overly promotional uh, or just about you know, advertising or anything like that, uh, you know, we're, we're here for the community. Um, so you can contact the organizer or email speak at drupalnyc.org. OK, who's hiring? So actually. <laughs> We don't have a we don't have a, a good way to do that um, while we're in this. Actually, we do have a good way to do that. Let's see if that'll work. So, uh, actually, I'm, I don't see the where's the raise a hand button? Is that disappeared? Not sure. There used to be a raise a hand capability, but that seems to have <laughs> have disappeared on us. So there's not a good way for us to know that you want to uh, to tell. Oh, Jed says he's not going to change things. But. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe yeah. because I'm on the stage, I don't get to see the button. Yeah. Perhaps uh, we can just point people at Slack um, to post, you know post the write, write it out, and it's better anyway to put links and things um, for anyone that might not be here at the moment for jobs. Yeah, we can, yeah, we can certainly do that. So Holing says she's raising her hand, and I can't see that. And I think oh, it's yeah. because I'm not yeah, logged in. As, emoji. <laughs> maybe because I'm not logged in as the uh, the primary host or something. So another 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 trouble with AirMeet here. <laughs> yeah. I, all right, we'll have to figure it out. Yeah, but I would say I would say why don't why doesn't anybody who is interested. Um, in saying that they are hiring, just mention that in the chat right here, and <clears throat> we can bring you up to the stage. All right, I'm just logging in over here uh, on the. <laughs> Uh -oh. I, did I did a bad thing. There we go. JD, if you want to, I don't know if you're able to make me a host, but I'll try. 
I am not able to work. Did I solve it? No. Not good. Sorry, everyone. Anyway, uh, the next slide is introductions, but we already did that. <laughs> so actually, no, we, we will do introductions. Um, oh. And yeah, we'll do that right now. So uh, we're going to turn on the the speed uh -huh. networking capability for just a few minutes. Um, and the way this is going to work is you're going to get kicked uh, kind of out of this main session and back to the networking area. And there's going to be something at the top where you can click on to do some speed networking. And uh, we'll just do it for a few minutes. Um, and we'll, we'll see how it goes. So uh, just a minute. Hey everyone, thanks for your patience. <laughs> I'll figure, figure this out. I hope you were able to have a conversation with somebody. I know some folks had trouble finding the, the speed networking uh, uh, area. But um, OK, just a moment here. We're going to see if our, our stream is working again. Bear with me a moment. Unclear. Well, regardless, we're we're not relying on our our stream to uh, to YouTube, um, but we were testing that out, see if it was going to work. But we're going to move on. <laughs> and um, John, do you have those slides handy to uh, present? Would you mind taking over, JD? I saw some. Yeah, prep. no problem. And yeah, whoever's talking should really have control of the slides. <laughs> <laughs> We've learned. Possible. Well, you know what we're going to do? I'm not even going to bother uh, doing the slides because <laughs> we're just going to hand it over to uh, to our first lightning talk uh, speaker. And I think that uh, Ian is not here. So Hussein, are you ready to talk about scaffolding? Yeah, I think as ready as I'll ever be. <laughs> All right. Fantastic. Well, well thanks for, uh, for bearing with us here. And, uh, I'll turn it over to you to, to share your screen. All right. Uh, so let me do that first. And I suppose it works. Yes, we can we can see your shared. All right. OK. OK. Uh, so hello, everyone. I'm Hussein. I live in Toronto area. I work for a company called Accelerant as a, a director for Drupal services. Uh, it's it's just a title, and uh, I also uh, you know go around in Drupal. Uh, I go I go by the username Hussein Web. You might have uh, seen me on Twitter as Hussein Web or D dot. I pretty much everywhere I go as Hussein Web. So today I just wanted to uh, uh, talk about this uh, tool that I've been working on since uh, some time, and I started. The intention was uh, was to quickly sc scaffold sites uh, for internal use. And then I thought, okay, it's quite generic, you know. You know, apart from a couple of dependencies which are kind of specific to Accelerant, but it's still usable, you know. Like even even if you use those dependencies, it's still quite generic. And uh, you know, in spirit of open source, uh, we you know we can kind of try to do everything in open. So uh, this was open source from day one. It's uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, okay. 
yeah uh, my intention is mit license but i'm not really sure you know uh, so even if license is not specified it is uh, mit so it is um, it is available it's uh, you know you can look at it you can you adapt it to your own needs or you can just use it and you know open an issue or pull request or anything but let me let me talk about the tool first so it's a scaffolding tool and the idea like i said is to quickly set up a drupal website with certain best practices that we always use and um, you, you know we do have uh, you know community standard best practices like okay you know we have a recommended project and everything but we find that you know even after doing that there is a lot to do uh, like a lot of decisions to make and that's my uh, guiding principle over here you know to eliminate as many decisions as we can because uh, I, i see it's not it's not an uh, we don't spend time in making one action after another it's often we spend time in you know just making a decision okay should you know should i add uh, you know like how from where do i pick up a template for blando for example or, or where do i pick up a template for redis things like that things like that so so i'm sorry i'm hearing an echo okay uh, it seems better now okay so i started this with this uh, intent that okay you you have a command called init drupal and um, you run it with some options and it will generate a scaffolding site uh, scaffolded site ready for you to use so the command is uh, let, let me talk about uh, it's written in python and uh, you know it, just because i wanted to learn python at the same time um, there was a very similar tool i had written earlier uh, it was a composer plugin but then it it was kind of difficult to manage so i wrote it i wrote it completely uh, you know from scratch in python and <coughs> uh, yeah you install it with uh, something called pip pip is something <coughs> excuse me pip is a, a dependency manager for python very similar to um, composer and um, we will not talk much about uh, you know like what pip is and you know how it works globally and everything so what we'll do is um, i'll just show you the command that you need to run to install this uh, tool you can do it right now uh, if you have pip installed chances are that you have it installed if you're uh, if you're using homebrew on mac you might have to use pip3 because it's uh, you need python3 for this uh, uh, by default you might have python2 so when you run this um, in my case i already have it so it just tells me that it's already up to date and you know it's satisfied and you should get the latest version 0.4.5 which i just tagged before we started this meetup actually during the meetup so yeah so we have this uh, tool installed so let's let's see let's use it okay so uh, first thing is uh, you know you like i said you know you have this command so as soon as you run this uh, pip3 install you get this command in your path uh, assuming python is in your path and um, i would say that okay you know uh, in a drupal and i give a composer style package name and uh, it could be anything as long as it's composer style so i'm just going to say husein web slash test site and um, enter so the first thing it tells me is that you know uh, because it also integrates composer in the workflow it checks you know if composer has been configured with enough memory uh, you, you know if uh, as most of us might still be using composer 1 um it's not enough you know like something like 512 mb memory limit is also not enough to install drupal you know using composer so it suggests that okay you know you know either set it change it in php settings or composer memory limit or do you want to continue anyway but uh, in my case i have installed composer 2 i don't need to worry about it right now so i'll just continue with anyway okay i, I think i need to delete this directory so what it does is it picks up the directory name from the name of the package over here so i uh, just have to delete it once and see yes again so it started you know it it has created an empty git repository it has already created a composer or json file and uh, you know it's now beginning to install uh, all the dependencies and uh, let me open this in a new tab to show what the scaffolded files look like so you can see that uh, you know i'm using certain uh, uh, let, let me just open the composer file so i'm using certain plugins uh, you know like this composer drupal optimizations which actually this particular plugin i don't need with composer 2 but you know uh, assuming composer 1 this is actually very useful 
uh, then I'm including Drush by default, uh, and I'm using this something called php.n. And uh, I will probably, uh, th this basically lets you load uh, environment variables from a dot n file. And uh, you know maybe that's a different topic, so I'll not go too deep into that. And then, like I said, there are a couple of accelerant specific things you know, in required dev. And that's you know mostly for our testing and for our quality check, we have these two packages. Again, uh, talking like this, it's kind of uh, off topic to talk about these two things. But again, the point is that you know you can see it, it's like a proper uh, scaffolded site. And uh, let's actually take it a step further. Uh, it seems like this is done, uh, but I'm just going to delete this again and uh, talk about a uh, few more features. Oh yeah, it's going to delete. So now what I want to do is that I also want to pro uh, configure the site uh, so that I have Lando out of the box. Uh, you know, we, we prefer Lando for our development environments. So I'm just going to say dash dash Lando. And um, I'm kind of partial to Redis as a caching service. It's it, it's like, you know, I always have it. Uh, you know, on any site that I built, I always have Redis, some cache at least, you know, I mean, if the infrastructure sub does not support Redis, but does memcache, that's fine. But I'm partial to Redis. And um, yeah, so this is good. Again, we get this thing about Composer. Composer 2 is great, by the way. And uh, just as a side note, while we see this install, um, uh, I was, uh, you know, like over the past couple of weeks, I've been testing things with Composer 2. And uh, it's a massive improvement. You know, I've, I've been tweeting and you know posting about this. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I think the like you know one of the major reasons we couldn't immediately go to Composer two was the Composer patches plugin. But I think just today or yesterday, uh, Cameron released a one point seven version of Composer two. Uh, sorry, the plugin which has Composer two support. And uh, the PR was merged earlier. It was in a dev release, but now with the tag release, it's you know people will pick it up much faster. Okay, so this is done. Oops, um, yeah, I need to go back inside this. Yeah, so now you can see that uh, we also have Lando specific files, and if you look at composer.json, we have uh, Drupal slash Redis over here. Uh, further, we have also configured Lando.yaml with Redis. So, uh, in fact, we've gone a step further. You know, we have even written um, settings file. So, like for example, for Lando, we have written this settings file. So you can, uh, you know, you can take a look at this. It's uh, loading all the environment variable, all the database settings, Redis specific settings. It's loading it from Lando information directly. So, what this looks like, uh, you know. You could run init Drupal with all those options, run Lando start, and you have a site ready. So let me, once it's up, it should not take a lot of time, you know. I mean, it's the first time it's running, so it'll take little time, but, and I am, you know, screen sharing, so it'll take a little bit more time because of that. But it should be done in a couple of seconds, hopefully. Did you, what kind of time limit do I have? I don't know how much time I've already spent on this. Good question. <laughs> I think you're almost at 10 minutes. Uh, but uh, we've got a little extra time. I'd say we can go to 12 minutes to talk because um, we've got All right. I think one just... speaker is not. All right, OK. So you can see the Lando site. You know, Since it's a first run, it takes a little extra time to set up everything. It's about to be done. And uh, what I want to show now is that you know you can see it's completely configured, including database details. So now, when I open the you know like, like when I load the website, of course I go to the installation screen, but it won't ask me for database details and all those kind of things. You know, it's it's all configured. Now, suppose you're not using Lando, you prefer the .env style approach. Uh, we also include uh, we also included settings.env, which uh, you know I just refer to that uh, place. So um, there is a uh, example env file for reference you know you just need to uncomment and set whatever you need to set over here and uh, it's loaded uh, 
courtesy of uh, this file. You know, similar to settings.lando, we have another file for .env, which again makes all of this Redis-related, database-related settings. And um, all of that is loaded from settings.php. You can see that we, we also modify settings.php to do. So we pretty much, you know, it's it's the care is taken so that we pretty much have like a site ready to go. And um, some of the things over here, so I didn't specify a core version, so it has most probably picked uh, Drupal 8.9, but you can specify that, uh, you know, using, uh, let, let me, yeah. So you can, uh, these are all the options that are available to you. You can set the description of your package, core package. So you can say, do you want to include Drupal slash core or Drupal slash core recommended? And uh, core version, so you can say, uh, you know, if you want, you can go to 9.0. Default is 8.9, like I said. Um, but for example, I was testing Drupal 9.1 dev release with PHP 8, and I used this. It, it just worked uh, perfectly. And few other things like Doc root and Lando, GitLab. GitLab supported put in a GitLab CI. We use GitLab at Accelerant. So again, there is like a little bit uh, of like scaffolding over there, like the CI related files for automated testing and all that. And uh, no install. It, it will basically not run Composer, but I'm actually about to remove that uh, because you know Composer too. Thankfully, we don't need to worry about uh, that that much. And you know, as we have more and more functionality added, it's really difficult to do anything without having a Composer-based site, like without Composer install already having run. So uh, while this again loads, you know, during screen share, everything is slowed down. I'm sorry about that. But let me just talk about a few more things, uh, you know, a few like immediate plans that I have. Um, apart from all the features, I want to add support for, uh, you know, like specifying modules out of the box. So you could you could have like, okay, scaffold me a site with this particular module uh, or like this set of modules. I'm already working on that, you know, uh, hopefully soon I'll have that support added in, 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 in like a next release. Uh, and the idea is that, you know, especially during contribution sprints. So the, the idea with scaffolding Drupal sites is for, you know, like if you want to build a quick experiment, proof of concept, or if you want to contribute, uh, you know, set up a contribution space. Uh, so you could quickly run this command, have it completely isolated, completely uh, separate Drupal site with all like the re required modules and everything. Test it out and that's it. So, um, yeah, that, that's it. You know, the installation starts, and uh, you know, once I select profile, it'll straight away go to installation site. Don't need to install any database details, nothing real. So I'm happy to take any questions. You know, you can while this uh, while this runs, and uh, like I said, I've already discussed the future roadmap. So anything about that as well? Any ideas, suggestions? Uh, please. Thanks. Thanks, Hussein. So, um, uh, Holing is manning our uh, our ability to to bring people to the stage to to ask questions. So you can you can either raise your hand, um, and you can come to the stage to ask a question, or you can just type it in the chat, a uh, little chat button on the right hand side. And uh, if you do that, I'll I'll read off your question. Yes. Thanks, Holing. Thanks, JD. And you can see it's like you can see it's already started installing. I'll paste the link to the repository over here. There is some documentation. Yeah, I should just mention you can run it using Docker. If you don't want to run Python for any reason, you can run it via Docker and so with something called Whalebrew. Uh, you know, if, if you're comfortable with running things via Docker, Whalebrew is, you might already have Whalebrew installed. So yeah, there are multiple options, uh, you know, to, to get this running. Fantastic. Why, uh, do we have any any questions, Holing? I don't see Holing says no questions there, and we don't have any in the chat. So uh, I think we'll wrap it up. Thank you so much, Hussein. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Very interesting. And um, we're going to move on now. Uh, John Pugh, are you ready to talk about DevShop Composer tools? Oh, sure. Uh, the one that can't make it was the one before me. Huh? All right. <clears throat> Yes. 
very good. <laughs> I'll leave it in your capable hands. Yeah, let me give me a second to. I thought I, I thought I had another uh, talk before that. Do you want me to go, John? Sure, if you're ready to jump yeah, in. Sure. Thank you. Yep. Introducing Amy June. Um, I just have to clean up my window real quick. Okay, so I'm not going to share my screen right away because I want to talk about accessibility for a second um, and why it's important. So accessibility is important for us as developers and designers and content authors and all of those things because we want people to be able to use our products and services, not only from like the user perspective, but from our admin backends as well. Um, the CDC estimates that 26% of Americans live with some form of disability. That's roughly 61 million people. And when we go outside of North America, those numbers get even larger. And we also have to think about things like situational disabilities, like a person that has a broken arm or they're outside in the sun and there's reflective, uh, the sun's reflecting on their screen and the color contrast doesn't work. And then there's unseen disabilities as well, um, like debilitating pain or fatigue, um, eyesight loss, hearing loss, um, or most of the time I can't find my mouse, right? So that's a situational or a temporary disability as well. So we have good intents when we build our websites. We design and we create mockups that are accessible like for WCAG standards or 508 compliance or ADA. Um, and we build those websites and we test them. But after we hand those websites off to our content creators or our stakeholders, it's very easy for them to break it, right? So that's why I say accessibility is a moving target. Not only do we have to think about as people go into our websites day to day, you know, because they are in there way after we're done with them, but also our standards change over time. Like right now we're on WCAG 2.1, but 2.2 is in the future. So I wanted to share today some tools that can kind of help us do accessibility gut checks on our um, on our sites. Uh, just you know, run them a couple of times a year, you know, or whenever your stakeholders or uh, or product owners feel that they want to do that. And this is especially important for people, for agencies and organizations that get government money, right? And they have to be five hundred eight compliant. And I'm going to iterate a couple of things several times. And one of them is not only the front end, but the back end, because we don't want to have a website where administrators can't access the content either. And we don't want to wait until there's someone on our team to build those features for folks. So I'm going to share my screen now. And we're gonna look at a popular website that a lot of people use. Um, I don't go to Starbucks because I have a lovely coffee shop around the corner from my house that's open. But Starbucks site is pretty nice. There's a couple of things when I first look at a website that I look at for accessibility. One of them being because I can never find my mouse is if it's keyboard accessible. So I'm gonna hit the um, tab key a couple of times and you can see that the skip to main content came up. You can also see as I tab through that there's, I have a highlighted focus, right? And you can see where I go throughout the page. You can see the links, you can see the pictures, you can see that focus, we can go through here. So that's a big part. And I'm gonna refresh the page. And I have this tool that I really like to use called the Site Improve Browser Extension. Site Improve is a pay for service and um, you can pay a lot of money to have this feature where it kind of documents your website over time. So it takes like a snapshot of your website at one point in time and then as you make improvements, it, it creates another snapshot and gives you sort of these points for improvement. But it costs a lot of money and they have this free browser extension that's super easy to use. And I like it because it's very intuitive. I can drop down here and I can look at all these different issues. So this website's pretty good. You can see the errors that are highlighted with uh, exclamation points. So we know that there's an error here. And if you click on this, it'll tell you the guideline and break it down. And it will also highlight it in code 
if you want to have the piece of code that you need. So it'll jump to that piece of code and tell you where it's um, not accessible. So that's an error with the little exclamation point. But what's nice about this tool is it not only gives the error, but it gives you warnings that you need to do manual checks for. I'm going to back up a little bit because automated tools are nice, but they can only catch the errors that they're programmed for. I'm going to say that again. They can only catch the errors that they are programmed for. And most of these accessibility tools are only programmed to catch about 30% of the errors programmatically. So these little warnings are perfect because you click on it and it tells you what to look for. So do you have an ARIA label that describes the element accurately? And you can go through here and you can look at all of them manually. So now I'm going to go to an awful website. Um, I like geocaching. I'm kind of a nerd like that. I like to go outside, but I like to have something to do. So I search for Tupperware using navigational um, satellites from space, you know. Um, so if I tab through this, you can see that there's no, you can't see where I am necessarily on this web page. You know, you can kind of see, but for the most part, you can't. Site improve tool for this page. There's all kinds of errors, you know, images with no alternative text. There's videos that have no captioning. There's videos that have no way of turning them off with the keyboard only. Um, some folks do not like to have videos on autoplay because of cognitive abilities, or maybe their browsers are slow to load and so their content is being missed. Um, so that's that tool. I'm going to go back to Starbucks and use the wave tool. The wave tool I don't like as much, but when uh, higher, edu higher ed organizations are audited, lots of their auditors will use the wave tool and base their findings on that. So I always suggest testing with the wave tool. You can see this site doesn't have a lot, but it, it provides a user interface with icons that makes things really easy to see and read. So you can hit details and you can- I'm sorry, Amy, Jim, we've lost your screen share. Oh no, like a long time ago? No, just now. Oh, okay. Thank you, Holing. Okay, are we back to the Starbucks site with the wave tool on? Yes. Okay, great. So it gives a graphical user interface where you can see the different icons. And then if you hit the information, it'll pull up those standards again, just like the site improve extension. Um, so going back to the geocaching website, because it's absolutely awful, there's a few things that the tools don't cover that you always need to manually test. And one of the standards that's super important for our, for our folks who might not see as well as everyone else is the functionality of zooming in. So if I hit command plus plus on my screen and zoom to 200%, I should still be able to find the data I need in the order it is and only have one scroll bar because having two scroll bars isn't compliant. Imagine how hard it is on a mobile device or, or a website where you don't have a mouse to be to have to scroll both ways, right? So testing, you know, making sure that you test really large. I'm going to go back. Um, and then uh, there are tools that you can use in the browser in your inspector element. I'm not going to like diss anybody, but I don't like any of them. Um, let's see. Um, Oh, I just got a new computer, so I don't know if these are installed. But there's the Lighthouse tool that you open up your inspector and there's a tab in there that runs the Lighthouse tool. And you always hear a lot of hype about the Lighthouse tool and the Axe tool, but they'll read this uh, geocaching um, website at 89% accessible. But we can see just by like tabbing alone how inaccessible the site is, right? Um, so, what I really want people to think about when they test these sites is um, who are your users? You know, look at your personas and who's using your website. You know, are you are focused more on geriatric people? You know, do they have tremors? Do they have low hearing? Is their eyesight deteriorated over time? 
Are you um, catering to a younger crowd, you know, so they're on their cell phone. So responsive imaging is super important. So making sure that you do user testing on a cell phone and making sure that the buttons are large enough for people's fingers to get to, you know, imagine if you have like a palsy or something like that. Um, so yeah, I just sort of wanted to, to, to sort of highlight these like really you know, free tools that people can use just to sort of do that gut check. They aren't extensive and there are things that aren't covered, but that site improve tool is super handy with all those manual, uh, all the reminders to test things manually. And I'll take questions because I don't know where I'm at in time. Thanks so much, Amy June. That was great. And yeah, we've got time for, uh, for a few questions. Um, so you can either raise your hand and Ho Ling will, will bring you to the stage um, with your camera. Um, or you can type it in the chat. Um, can you elaborate on some, I have my own stories of like accessibility when a project has like a lead, like a lot of government projects are legally required to have accessibility um, and like can get sued and there's even like legislation right now trying to like soften that or whatever um, can, Is there any um, I don't know. I don't have a specific question I guess but could you speak on like how Why that's a, it is important how it does go all the way go all the way back to like the ADA and, well, uh, Sure, um, I'm a hospice nurse by trade so when I got into tech and found out that people could build accessible websites, but they don't, or a lot of the default things in Drupal are accessible and you actively have to disable those and now they're inaccessible, it just, it was a bizarre concept to me. And so that's why I got into the field of accessibility, but it's not about the ADA and it's not about 508 compliant and it's not about WCAG. It's about really thinking about leaving a quarter of the population behind. So it's empathy, right? That's the, that's me coming from like being a mother and being a nurse, right? But the idea is with the ADA, the ADA is more, it's for the government agencies and it specifically calls out that admin inter interface. So it's not only the front, but the back and you can get sued. Um, what they'll do is they'll do like an arbitration process where someone will come in and do the audit and then you're given X amount of time to fix it. Um, but it's just easier not to build those websites in the first place, right? But what agent or what the website stakeholders can do is they can write an accessibility statement and have a link to that maybe in their footer with their plan of how they're planning on making that website accessible in the future. And that can get them out of a lot, but it has to be true, right? You can say, we know that these PDFs are antiquated and none of them are accessible. Our, our future plans are to upload accessible PDFs, things like that. And you can have that in your accessibility statement. And that can go a long way. A lot of museums have that, you know, because they get a little bit of government support. So, but they have to be true. <laughs> you can't just say you're going to do something and not do them. Did that answer you, John? That, that answered me enough because okay. like, yeah, there is, uh, there's the spirit of what you should do and then there's like legal requirements and all that. But I think it's, um, uh, and there's, it's interesting it's, that, you, that you point that out, that it's like, you're, like when you're building a web website, you want the broadest audience possible anyway. Especially for a commerce website where you're generating revenue, right? You want to be able to have people go into the shopping cart, like, and then be able to get out of the shopping cart too. So there's like keyboard traps, there's color contrasts, mm -hmm. there's links, there's all kinds of things to think about. The list just goes on and on. So. Cool. Thanks. <laughs> thanks so much, Amy June. Uh, we don't have any other questions. Um, so thanks again. And we'll, we'll move on to uh, our next talk. Um, so John, uh, yeah, let's do it. Do it to it. Oh, applause for, uh, <laughs> for Amy June, yeah. Emoji applause. Okay, bear with me one more second. <clears throat> Uh, 
Okay. So I have a very old project and I'm trying to modernize it. And it was so old that I didn't even have the words to describe it a long time ago. <laughs> so I called it a Drupal cloud hosting and testing platform. And I said cloud because you basically the main thing was you would get pushed to your site and it would like deploy it. You know, and it's so old, it kind of came about before that was really a common, common thing. Um, so now, kind of fast forwarding to what I'm trying to do now, is like DevOps is a much broader, uh, broader field. There's so much more going on in terms of composer building and, and so many things. Um, and DevShop's always been a, a, like a flexible framework anyway, because it's built on Drupal. Um, so more and more, uh, you tweak it. You know, you like add a library that runs a test, or you add, you know, um, the hat to do this, or, and so it's customizable already. And I've always been spinning off little pieces on it. So I'm rebranding DevShop as a as a framework and a collection of tools, much like Symfony uh, or Drupal is a framework uh, and collection of tools for building websites. Uh, DevShop is now going to be branded as a framework for building DevOps pipelines and uh, you know systems management stuff, uh, all the way down to even the description. Like I modeled the description off Symfony itself. Um, set of reusable components, uh, and when and it all comes together to make like the all-in-one uh, DevShop kind of product that you may have heard of or seen. But the main point is that by separating it out into components, it's all about empowering users to choose their own uh, infrastructure, choose their own tooling, choose their own everything. Um, Ansible and Ansible Galaxy and these tools allow you to install it on Linux on any, any data center, any computer on your own, um, but you still get that complete, uh, complete user experience. And so the main components that I've extracted out of DevShop are what I call DevShop Control now, which is the tr traditional product you see. It's a Drupal distribution, but it's also a CI, it's a Drupal CI dashboard out of the box, right? That's the web UI for DevShop that you usually think of when you hear DevShop. Now it's a composer-based package that you can use at the front end, and make, which makes it much easier to extend. YAML tasks are the little library I wrote to run a single command, YAML tasks, some public composer YAML tasks, or a bin directory call to run a set of tasks out of a YAML file, and it passes those off to GitHub API, to the GitHub status, replacing entirely the GitHub API integration in DevShop. So with a single command and a single composer library, you can have like full featured kind of CI integration in GitHub, and I'll show you how that works in a minute. Uh, power process is a very simple stripped down component just for running processes. So if you're familiar with Symphony Console, Symphony, or, uh, you know, and Composer, all these things are built on components, boiling down to this process component. Symphony process component is very bare bones thing. We're running commands. This is like what we needed to make it a little fancier. So it runs it with special output. It has special options. It allows me to use a command line thing to like send the output to different places. All the other tools run on power process. And so you can use it independently or YAML tasks run uses power process to run the tasks. Git split is a tool we wrote that to split all these things from a mono repo, or I like to say mega repo, with a single command, which was critical in building a framework and that each component is all in one Git repo. So I can edit the code for the YAML tasks and power process and the composer Git tools in one PR. They test against each other and then they push out to separate components on packages using this Git split tool. It's the same tool that is run by uh, uh, Symfony itself to break up into, into packages and Drupal core uh, actually uses it too. Split SH is this shell script written by the great Fabian Potencier from uh, the Symfony creator. So now I broke out that logic and made it into a composer plugin. So, uh oh, am I still there? I'm just going to assume I'm still there. Yeah, I see. Airmeet has frozen for me. I don't know if it's frozen for you. I'll reload and try. 
Yeah. You, uh, you you still look fine, John. We can see uh, we can see your screen uh, with the Dev Shop component showing. I think John is going to rejoin us here. Hello. How, how long have I been gone? Uh, <laughs> we we can still uh, we can still hear you and see your screen. Um, okay. But, uh, you'll so need to start your screen again. Okay. Cool. Yeah, the, my web browser froze, so uh, I wasn't sure of it. Apologies, or hear me froze. It's the tab itself. Okay, uh, so you heard me get up to Git split, I think. Uh, okay, so Git, and then the GitHub API is very simple CLI for pinging GitHub APIs for other things, uh, and that's another way to allow me to not have to program that directly to DevShop. It means it's a composer plugin, so you can run GitHub and then just simple commands to interact with the GitHub API in interesting ways. Uh, and then the composer Git tools are pretty neat things that are not only described generically here, but I'll show you those in a second. Um, so that's we're probably halfway through my lightning talk, right? Five minutes. So I actually got a project going here. Let's see if we can get it up and running and play with some of these toys. OK, um, this was the same Drupal 8 core, uh, or sorry, recommended project that we just saw presented. Um, I started a brand new project. I'll post the link to the Git repo in a uh, momentarily. Um, that's not it. So right now, the first thing I required was YAML tasks. And a YAML tasks file can look as simple as this. Um, and it's like the set of commands you want to encapsulate as your test run, right? And so oftentimes when you're in CI, you, you're the list of the command that you actually want to run as a test is stored in who knows where. Well, it's a worst case scenario, it's not even in your code base. But this makes it a, a simple YAML file. And it, there's all these little things that allow it to uh, make it easier to run and make it more dynamic and directly integrate with GitHub. And so when you want to do a composer require, that shop YAML tasks, which I already did. So it shouldn't, shouldn't even bother waiting for that. You get a composer YAML tasks command and also a bin YAML tasks uh, command, which automatically reads the Git repository, loads the Git data out of the Git repo, figures out what commit it is, looks up the tasks file that I have, um, gives you a little summary. And if you have a GitHub API key set, it will ping the GitHub commit API with these as they run. Um, and then prints it out in a relatively pretty way because it's meant for to make developers' lives a little easier. Um, so now, I think I pushed, right? What I can do is I want a little pull request. And thanks to GitHub, I can do this very easily. Um, add another little command. Create a new branch. Oops, sorry. Requests. And so for those that don't know, what I just did is like I'm creating a new branch off the main branch of code to make changes in a safe, isolated place from master branch, main branch. Um, so and then I open a what's called a pull request on GitHub so that I can submit my changes and say, hey, is this ready? And it's a very powerful tool to let other developers kind of review what you're doing. And so by default, it's like ba very basic. It gives you like no, it just tells you what commits you ran and um, you know what files changed. But it has this system that allows you to do commit status. And so if you're getting into CI or DevOps, uh, you'll see systems actually send a, that green or red status back to the commit on GitHub. Um, so let's actually, so first I'm going to check out that branch.
And then I'm going to make a new test on here called um, clean code. And it, I, I, this friend of mine said, or my developer said, I have a great script. Please check my code uh, whenever, you know, in RCI. And so I said, OK, I'll run the clean code script. And so when I do that, and say, oh, I'm fine with that. I don't, I don't test my code first. I just commit it. Um, and code test. And so, what the frame? The whole point of what I do is to try to simplify all this stuff. So I'm not even going to like install this site. I'm not going to install CI at all. This tool will allow me to run those tests anywhere. So I can actually run the CI. The same thing that would happen in CI, but on my laptop. And so when I run this against my laptop, it should run the tests and also update GitHub on the right, which is rad. Because <laughs> you can like really test out the tooling and um, interact directly with the GitHub API, and you save yourself a lot of cycles like fighting with your DevOps platform, whatever that may be. So this tool, for example, could be run on a Pantheon or anywhere, you know, anywhere you can think of, because it's just a composer plug and it's just a part of your, your website, your app. Uh, so let's see if that's true, if this will really work. Uh, OK, so Composer, I'm sorry, no, we're going to use bin YAML pass. And I already set a, um, let me show you the help text. Basically, it'll run like a dummy. It'll run a uh, empty task run if there's no GitHub API key, but I added it. Um, token here, sorry. So if you set a GitHub token environment variable, which is very common, like they put it in the GitHub actions and other things, uh, you can just pass this variable. But I also set it in my environment, so I don't have to have it in the command line. So now when I run it, uh, well, actually, yeah, if I run a bad token, for example, let's test that. Token XYZ, it'll try it, and it'll say, oh, I can't. Um, but if I take that away, We're just over time, John. So uh, yeah, that's about it. So that's basically it. The dry run is enabled right now. So, uh, but basically, what would happen? No kidding. Okay. Oh yeah. So I didn't set it. I guess. There you go. So there's a URL I have to pass, but uh, since my time is short, I'll leave it at that. Um, but the whole purpose of this is to take, take DevOps, demystify it, make it easier to understand. Um, we've got a lot of other tools that we, I'll talk about later. Um, Git repository aware trait, for example, if you include that in a module, it'll, you can just say this Git repo and Git tag, and you'll know what tag your code is running on. And so that's, uh, that's my lightning talk. And that's, thank you very much. Questions? Awesome. Thanks so much, John. Uh, Oling says we have no raised hands, but uh, we'll give it a, another moment if anybody wants to raise their hand or type a question in the chat here. Uh, I have a question. Uh, thanks, John. This, uh, these components that you walked us through, like how do you see them playing inside the dev shop uh, overall? You know, like like the the code. Yes. Are you asking about where the code lives? No, no, not not with the code lives. I, I, I think you know uh, I can find the Git uh, the GitHub repo, okay. But um, I'm talking about like what's the plan with these components and integrating it in, inside that open dev shop? You know, I I, I thought right. that was like a uh, you know spin up your own control panel for your own hosting, something yes, like yes. that. Right. Right. So, by one of the challenges was that like. I wanted it to do all the things. So like the commit status integration and the deploy integration, like all the GitHub APIs and everything was in, in, in one big mess of a pile of code in DevShop because it's Drupal modules, right? And so by breaking out the Composer Git tools, for example, that's like a Git repository class that I can now use across the whole project. So I could just say like get, get branch and, and there it is. And so it's going to accelerate the mod, like the development of the project, and uh, it will allow us to upgrade easily, more much more easily to like Drupal eight because the logic is all in these components, right? Okay. So, yeah. 
Okay, so it, it makes the process right. I, I don't have to write a shell exec script ever again because it all goes through Power Process, and so all right. the extra features of piping the the logs and any any fancy features can go right in the library instead of in this like DevTop's like a monolith right now, right? Agar, it's like everything is in there. There's a, a three or four instances where it has to say, "Hey, what's the Git branch?" So I can print the branch. When now it's like a library, just Git reference, uh, mm -hmm. Git tag, you know, or uh, Git repository Git tag. Right. Oh so, yeah, it's, it's been awesome. So it's already been happening, right? So I've already been using the components for about like at least a six months, six to nine months. Um, but like the overall branding is is relatively new, and so it's been a very very helpful uh, because like. Just on a, as a very basic level, it's super simple stuff like Git repository aware trait. This is something I think everyone could try to use now is the composer common. Uh, I apologize because I really want to rename it because it's more useful than that. GitHub, Git repository aware trait. For those of you who don't know what a trait is, you can take any class and just say use this trait, and then your class inherits all the methods. And so, like, Git repository is a very powerful class that has like get the SHA and get the branch and get the log and get the whatever. And so you can actually think about putting in your Drupal code, like print a link to the GitHub PR in the site you're looking at type of okay. work. You know what I mean? Yeah, and, yeah. And this TQ, this class is very powerful, uh, a very powerful class. And it's all, all the where trait does is wraps your class in it. So then other classes, I can now have a standard way that's just like get repo and then get branch, or get repo, get remote, get repo, get et cetera. And it, became, it becomes incredibly easier, so much easier to develop because it's of the symphony pattern, of object-oriented patterns. You know? Yeah. John? Right now, exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, are you good, Hussein? Yeah, yeah, I'm good. OK, good. perfect. Thank you, Hussein, for the question. And uh, thanks to John for uh, another interesting presentation. Um, and uh, our next speaker is Gaurav, and he's going to talk to us about API developer portals. So I'll hand it over to you. Hey, thanks, John. Oh, for thanks, Shiri. Um, let me make sure that I can share the screen. I should do the tab, right? OK, yeah. There you go. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, it just shared. OK, cool. So mine will be, you know, Straightforward, quick. <laughs> you know, uh, I like have three, four slides, and largely, you know, I wanted to talk about because this is something that you know was at least to me personally was, um, you know, uh, I, I was just not aware of you know something like this, right? Uh, you know, at least a couple of years back, right? And this has been just you know increasing, you know, you know day by day, month by month, and it's it what it it's very clear to me that it's it's a huge market. It's a huge market that uh, you know is being opened up in the last year or so. Um, you know, especially with uh, you know the you know after the Google acquisition uh, of APG and then you know uh, the MuleSoft uh, and both IBM you know looking at Drupal and then Kong also looking at Drupal. Uh, so you know, and that's why the API developer portals. I just wanted to you know talk about so you know whatever at least I didn't knew and if the if the folks in audience also didn't knew about this. Uh, this massive place, which Drupal is at least eating, um, you know, of API developer portals, and uh, you know, maybe maybe this would help. So, you know, and and largely the context is that you know, if you're looking at you know, saying that okay, apart from using Drupal to build portals or websites or you know, you know, different uh, you know web web portals, what what is the different other place where there's a lot of uh, you know money investment is going in the market, right? And I think one big big part is the API developer portals, right? And we all knew about the Twitter. API developer portals, but you know this is something that you know I believe is has really really uh, taken in uh, in the last uh, year and a half, if you will, right? So you know basic stuff, right? Uh, you know API is in 2020. I use this slide, you know, sometimes you know in my pitches as well. Um, you know the the APIs are you know opening up. The dev whole developer ecosystem is opening up. If you look at the programmable web, you know you would see uh, you know the the growth in APIs has been phenomenal. In the last uh, you know few years, right since 2014, and it's been on the rise today, right? Um, you have uh, a lot of startups coming in this space. The microservices is a very uh, you know well accepted phenomena, right? And you know the whole everybody is looking to tap in the in the developer ecosystem. Communities is actually uh, you know taking a lot of 
I would say, you know, I mean, a lot of enterprises are looking at saying then building communities. So overall, the whole developer ecosystem is, is actually uh, blowing up right now, right? And uh, you know, with the uh, with the uh, APG, so you know, stepping back, if a lot of people don't know, so APG has been a front runner for in this ecosystem API uh, integration ecosystem for very very long. Google acquired it a few years back, and it's now a part of the Google Cloud. And you know, APG actually initially uh, chosen to build all their developer portals in Drupal, right? And and that's how they started with Drupal seven. And uh, you know what happened is that you know if you look at T-Mobile, if you look at AT&T, if you look at Garmin, if you look at you know uh, you know a lot of banks, you know a lot of them are you know end up having the you know the Drupal as a, as the Drupal portal because APG, which was the forefront runner in this ecosystem, uh, you know used Drupal for building their you know developer portal initially, right? And that's how it went. And then you know slowly and slowly, MuleSoft, which is now acquired by Salesforce. Uh, also, you know, uh, you know, you know, started using it. It's not like by default, but you know, a lot of new soft uh, developers, you know, are, are using Drupal uh, as the as the as the ecosystem. And then Kong, which is the open source version, and you know, it's now a leader in the Gartner as well in 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 the API integration space, is also using Drupal as as the developer portal, right? So the short story is that you know, there's a there's a there's a hell lot of um, you know money is going in, right? And whatever I know. You know, is that you know the the, the demand and supply is is, is um, very different, right? So you know there are not a lot of a lot of contractors, freelancers, people, companies who are uh, you know really well versed with the APG, the APIs, you know how you know and how to essentially build all that that stuff, right? So and we've been you know been something working on this for the last couple of years, and you know we see a lot of success, and I thought you know why not just you know share with the community. Um, you know, a few of the slides on, you know, just how, why everybody like Accenture, ThoughtWorks, McKinsey, HBR, right, sees this as a, as a huge, um, uh, you know, uh, growth area, right? Uh, you know, since there was an API integration report which came out and they said, you know, that 83% of the businesses are looking at API as a critical part of their business strategy, right, uh, in 2020, right? And 77% of the, the people that they surveyed actually already invested in, in some kind of API management tool. Right, and there's a good chance that if you know both, you know either if even if it's not an external de uh, developer portal, and I different in internal as well because in a large organization you have needs of you know different vendors, different you know application teams internally, right, to consume APIs, um, you know get keys, you know manage applications, throttling, you know uh, API definitions and things like that, right. All that is also you know if not only external, right. So but it, even internal there is a huge uh, you know, demand of you know uh, getting this you know developer portal up, and Drupal is actually playing a, a big piece in that. And uh, you know, I, I got this just slide from from Dreef talk, right? And how he was talking about decoupled and APIs. It's not directly linked to what I was talking, but you know, I think just overall we would see. I was at the Jamstack conference yesterday, and you know, I think uh, you know a lot of talks, you know, was talking about that how. Very quickly, right? Uh, you know the APIs that you are managing goes out of hand, right? When you start building large systems, right? And you know how it, you know, with, when you have large systems and different teams, how it becomes extremely important to be able to have a place where you are, you know, managing these APIs very well, right? And and and, and you know, these developer portals, internal and external developer portals, become extremely important. Um, last slide. Uh, so you know, this is something that we are open sourcing. Uh, you know. Uh, you know, soon, right? It just you know, right now, you know, again, all internal projects, so it gets delayed. We should have open source by now, but but this is something that we have you know built on uh, and worked on. You see all you know, um, you know, API gateways like Kong and APG and Web Methods and WSO2, which is another Sri Lankan very open and open source and very very popular in in, in a lot of organizations, especially in commerce. Uh, and you know it also connect with AWS API gateway. So what we've done is that we have taken you know, you know whatever we have worked done you know a lot of different places we have taken up and that kind of consolidated into one open source Drupal uh, distribution, if you will, right? And um, you know it is uh, you know it you know connects with all these API gateways and gives you you know capabilities of having a content management system internally for creating you know articles you know usual stuff of Drupal and then. 
a community and element for you know managing your developers community internally you can run api monetization programs which come out of the box you can run support system for developers which is a community driven support so it has all the elements to it you can do api cataloging api discovery you know referencing of the apis you know uh, you know or in different different formats you know analytics nps right so basic you know you know portal stuff is all you know pretty much you know comes out of the or you know uh, out of the box and what it does it it connects to um you know different uh, api integration layers so that you know you can pretty much run very quickly uh, you know up to go so we've been be working on this for some time you know it's already being used at a lot of places but it's we're just trying to consolidate it and you know release in the community soon so that was a quick one uh, would love to take any questions if anybody would have any uh, questions on either api ecosystem or api developer portals or open devx if you will fantastic thanks parav any questions out there you can raise your hand or uh, type it in the chat if you're uh, not on the stage already no raised hands yet i'm told emoji yeah. claps all around <laughs> thank you for that <laughs> awesome and uh yeah, thank you so much, Grav. Very interesting. And uh, next up, we are going to have uh, Mauricio, uh, and Mauricio is going to talk about what's Mauricio going to talk about? <laughs> Converting a static site into a dynamic React.js application. Over to you, hey. Mauricio. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Loud and uh, can you see the screen? Yes. Okay. Uh, so, given that we have ten minutes, uh, we're going to be, you know, quick. The um, website itself is not very complex. It's mostly some HTML, but the idea is to explain the different steps to go uh, when transforming, you know, a static site into a React application. So, there are three things that we're going to do at the very beginning. Like this is the on the left, you see the markup of the site. Uh, as you can see, very straightforward there. And on the right, we see the results. So there are three things that we need to do. One, on the HTML uh, file, we need to include the React.js library. Then we also need to in, uh, include what element in that uh, HTML is going to be used for mounting the React application. And then we need to um, link the JavaScript file containing the React application uh, that's going to be used for rendering the site. So the first step is, uh, I have some things prepared already. Uh, it's just uncommenting the, the, the lines that get the script for React and React DOM. The reasons because we have to import two libraries is because React itself is able to be like the core package to be used for rendering to different um, types of applications like a web application, a mobile application, and so on. So the Re React is the core library, and React DOM is the one responsible for dealing with the browsers. Um, the first thing that I want to show is like how to change this line that says vote for your favorite one. Uh, instead of having it rendered from the HTML itself, I am going to have it rendered from, from React. Uh, so instead of that, I'm going to have a mounting point, it's called. Uh, it's just like any element, in this case, identify by ID. But I, ID. And uh, this is where I'm going to load my application. And at the very bottom, I have uh, another script tab to include my specific uh, application code. This is the code that is going to be used by myself to, to render the line that was removed before. Um, I am not saving this because I want to explain the script first. In the script itself, we also need to do three steps. The first one is uh, create, a like in this case, we are only replacing one line. Instead of the whole site, we are only replacing one line. And what we're doing is uh, creating a React element, it is called. In this case, uh, you might recall that it was a P element, like this is a P element, uh, and this is the text that I want to use. Uh, so in, the first step is creating the element. The second step uh, is identifying the DOM container where I want to render the React application. So this is regular JavaScript, document get element by, get element by ID. And then this is the ID that I assigned uh, you know, in my HTML. And once I have the element, 
and the container, I use React DOM and tell it to render that element in that container. And by saving this, um, I am already uh, I am already rendering this uh, with uh, React. If I were to inspect the code, I can see that I have my D with the ID that I had, and then everything inside is being rendered by React itself. Um, as you can see, you can use React to you know, render the whole application, or in this case, a single line. But let's take this a step further. Um, I'm going to paste some code in the HTML here. Because uh, one thing that we had was that the text was uppercase, and that text was uppercase because we had a class applied to the p tag. So if you want to apply a tag um, in in the same you know create element, you know the first is the tag that you want to use, and then you have an object uh, specifying different properties of of the element. In this case, by specifying class name and subheading, that means we are going to apply the subheading class to this particular p tag. And before, I only had uh, one like piece of text, like one string for the whole text to render. In this case, I am breaking it up as you know. You can starting from your third element onwards. You can have as many strings as you want, and those will be concatenated. Or you can also create more React elements that are going to be nested inside each other. So in this particular case. I am saying uh, both for, and then create another React element that is going to be a strong tag, uh, no classes whatsoever, and then the text is going to be your favorite, and then some extra text. And by saving this, I get the same effect that I had before. Um, it's, it's just like a, a hierarchy of elements nested in such of each other. Um, you might think that, you know, this is very complicated to read. And if you have very complex structures, it doesn't make a lot of sense to write in this way. So the, you know, React framework has uh, another library that we can use. Not, not a library, excuse me, another syntax that we can use called JSX. And let me uh, paste the code for that. So uh, in, in, in this case, what we're going to do is instead of just rendering one line, I'm going to render the whole heading using uh, this new syntax. And this is what you see on the screen. It is basically HTML with some changes. For example, if you want to specify the class name, you don't do it by saying class. You, you say you, you use class name. And there are about four differences between regular HTML and, and JSX. But if you want to use this syntax, if I zip here, it is not going to work. And the reason is, this is not valid JavaScript. Um, I am within a JavaScript file. So what you need to do uh, in, you know, there are many ways to work around this. But uh, in my case, I am going to use Babel to transpile that uh, 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 that syntax into valid JavaScript. And in addition to adding the Babel library at the top, I also need to update my script tag at the bottom to say that, you know, that script should be work as text Babel. And you can see that I have some duplication here. And the reason is because I am rendering the whole React application, which is going to have the header and the H1. Uh, so what I need to do is just do a little bit of cleanup here. And now I, instead of rendering that in HTML, I am rendering it in the React application. And I can literally copy and paste all of these and say that I want to render not only one line, but the whole you know, page in my React application. Uh, for that, um, I'm, I'm going to paste uh, some code here. One second. So uh, now uh, what I wanted to show is that uh, in my header before, I had this uh, just like plain HTML. After having the element in plain HTML, I created something that is called a React component. And a React component can be reused as many times as needed. The re general rule is that React components start with a capital letter. And once you have it, them defined, you can use them as regular HTML tag, you, starting with a you know, capital letter. So what I did here is create you know that header element, and then create another element called candidate list, 
and that candidate list component contains my H2 and then my section. And then I create another element called a candidate, and that is going to contain the markup of all the individual uh, uh, elements that are going to be rendered. You know, each of them will have an article tag with an H3, a div, and an image. And as you can see, uh, this particular one receives something that is called props. These are um, uh, called uh, com uh, L component pro properties. And these are kind of, you know, HTML attributes that you can pass and they serve like variables. So, you know, for this component, pass the name uh, React and that is going to be rendered inside the H3 tag. The year, the image source and so on. And those are going to be replaced inside the React application here. And just as a general uh, thing that, you know, that case is what it is, is still static, just being rendered by React. But you can also have, you know, like a voting system and things automatically rearranging themselves based on the interaction from the user. And this is actually uh, an open source repository that you can, I'm going to paste a link, but uh, on my GitHub repository, it's called React Basics. And the there is an exercise folder where there are like step-by-step -step instructions on how to go like, you know, all that I did like step-by-step. -step. There is a presentation, a recording of a longer version of this talk. And uh, I am also going to eventually write about that on my website, understandrupal.com. And the last thing is that rumors has it that in a near, uh, in a Drupal like near you, there will be a workshop uh, on this topic. So if you want to learn about, you know, this process, uh, there will be a workshop explaining all this uh, soon. And I think that's my 10 minutes if there are questions. Fantastic. Thanks, Mauricio. Um, so yeah, any questions? You can type it in the chat or raise your hand. Well, if there are no questions, uh, thank you, everyone. And I will be around uh, in the chat. Perfect. Thanks, Mauricio. Appreciate it. And another great talk. OK. Um, so next up is someone named JD. I guess that's me. And uh, I'm going to talk about automatically building and deploying from GitHub to Pantheon using GitHub Actions uh, for CI CD. Um, so I am going to share my screen. If I can figure out how. <laughs> OK. And um, I can't keep track of my own time while I'm presenting, so Ho Ling, I'll, I'll leave it to you to cut me off. <laughs> um, OK, so GitHub Actions is a CI CD solution, continuous integration, continuous uh, deployment. And uh, what I'm going to show you is how you can uh, take a, a Drupal code base um, uh, that you have on GitHub and deploy, uh, automatically kind of deploy that uh, to Pantheon. Um, so for those who are not familiar with Pantheon, Pantheon um, has a, a dev environment, a test environment, and a live environment, um, kind of following a best practice. And the idea is that you deploy your code initially to your develop dev environment, then to your test environment, and finally to your live environment. Uh, and Pantheon also has a concept of multi-dev environments, basically additional environments um, that uh, are handy for various things. You might deploy a feature branch there to uh, do some QA and testing, uh, or maybe to show it off to a client or to uh, you know someone else in your organization. And uh, we're going to start off here uh, because we have only a little amount of time um, by just kicking off uh, one of these uh, one of these workflows. So in GitHub Actions, uh, workflows are the the largest unit of of action, uh, and a workflow can have a number of jobs within it, and the jobs each have a number of steps that run commands and, and do whatever needs doing. Um, so to start, um, I'm just going to commit something uh, that I have queued up here um, into a feature branch called my branch. doesn't really matter what it is that I'm committing, um, but I'm committing that. And did I push that up? Yes, I did. Um, and so we should see here now in the GitHub Actions uh, tab on GitHub for my repository, uh, example change. Uh, showed up here, and you can see the yellow dot spinning here. That means that uh, this CI, uh, is, this workflow is currently in progress. So let's hop on over here and see what we see. Um, so there are 
uh, there's a, a single workflow, uh, and it's called CI Accept Main. Uh, and the purpose for this workflow is whenever you have a feature branch, so you, it's a branch other than your uh, your you know main branch or master branch. Um, that's when this workflow runs. And as you see on the left over here, um, there are two components uh, to that workflow, two jobs. One is called Drupal Coding Standards, and the other is called Build. Uh, and if we go into Drupal Coding Standards, uh, we can see what happened here. There's a green check mark next to that because that already completed successfully. Um, and basically what's happening here is we're using uh, an existing uh, GitHub action provided in the GitHub Actions marketplace called PHP CS Drupal Action um, to run PHP Code Sniffer um, uh, using uh, you know the definitions that we provide in our repository, um, and that works its magic and decides whether or not we've met uh, Drupal's coding standards for our uh, custom code is how we have it configured. Uh, and then the second job that we ran here was called Build, and uh, this does a few things, as you can see. Um, the most kind of relevant piece here uh, is that we validate composer.json and composer.lock to make sure that they are valid and in sync. Um, and then if we skip over this caching stuff, which we'll touch on a little later, um, we, do a, we run composer install. Um, so we have kind of a shallow repository here. Um, you know, a, a, I guess an increasingly evolving best practice is to not have uh, your vendor directory, your, your contrib modules, and any other composer managed dependencies, or any other package manager managed dependencies actually uh, in your Git repository, your main Git repository. And so that's the setup we have right now. So we run composer install, which downloads all the dependencies um, and installs them. Um, and that's basically all we're doing here. So not a lot of exciting stuff going on here. Keep in mind, we are in a feature branch. Um, and now we're going to pop back to the Actions tab here. And just to orient you on the interface, on the left-hand side uh, are filters. And the filters are basically uh, the various workflows that are defined. So these are the workflows that we have defined in our repository. And uh, we just demoed CI except main, which, as you saw, it didn't do a whole lot. But it did verify that Composer could build successfully. Uh, and if we had uh, a theme set up, maybe with N NPM um, you know, to build a, a front-end theme. Uh, we could include that in the build step there or in a separate step, um, but we don't have that uh, live in this repository. Uh, and if you navigate to one of these filters, like deploy to multi-dev is one of the workflows, um, this workflow is configured to be manually uh, executed. And so this workflow, I have a run workflow button that I've configured over here. And if I click on Run Workflow, then it gives me some options which I've configured. Uh, and in particular, uh, you can choose which branch to, to use the workflow from and also to kind of run the workflow on. And so, uh, as you recall, we used My Branch. So we're going to go to My Branch, uh, and we're going to say that we want to deploy this to a multi-dev environment on Pantheon. Um, for simplicity, I've pre-created the multi-dev environments on Pantheon and named them M1 through M10. Uh, and so you just choose which one you want to deploy to here. And you, you can also say uh, from which other Pantheon environment do you want to clone the database and files. Uh, so that ensures that when you deploy to uh, the multi-dev environment uh, that you're working with the latest uh, content uh, from your live site. Or in this case, I'm going to use the test environment um, just because my live environment's a little different. Um, and I'm going to go to Run Workflow. And so now, without using, you know, without going to my console or terminal on my computer and without logging into the Pantheon uh, dashboard, uh, we are actually deploying to a multi-dev environment on Pantheon. And so you can see uh, that's in progress here. So we're going to click through here. So we're still running our Drupal coding standards check, and we're still running our deploy to Pantheon multi-dev. Uh, and those are running in parallel. Uh, it's certainly possible to define the job such that uh, it won't deploy if the coding standards fail. Uh, but at the moment, we just have them running in parallel. It's just kind of an FYI. Uh, and you can see here, it's gone through some steps, and it's already down at install terminus. Uh, terminus is Pantheon's 
command line interface uh, tool that interacts with the Pantheon API to uh, allow us to run these commands against uh, the Pantheon environments and, and actually deploy there. Um, so you can see it's proceeding on its way here. And the uh, nice thing about this is you get all the output from the commands that are run. Um, so it's very helpful for debugging and figuring out what might go what, what might have gone wrong when you're doing a deployment. Um, and so that'll that'll take a minute. Um, but as we'll see in a moment, well, I guess we can let this run. It's going pretty quick here. Ah, you might hear my daughter Ramona in the background screaming. <laughs> it's one of those nights. Um, okay, so now we're actually pushing the code up to Pantheon Multidev. So that's that's just a git push. Um, and that's kind of gone off. And so now this uh, workflow has completed. Uh, and if I pop over to my Pantheon dashboard here, and I go to workflows, uh, you can see that uh, the database was cloned from test to M1, and the files were cloned from test to M1. So that's uh, just what we wanted to happen. Uh, and the code presumably was also updated as well. OK, where are we going to go now? OK, so we just deployed the multi-dev. Um, and that's kind of the, the flow you use with a, a feature branch. But if you want to put something uh, you know, up to, to deploy all the way to live, you would uh, deploy it to dev. And we have it uh, defined right now where any change to the main branch, uh, it could be the master branch uh, in your repository, uh, results in an automatic deployment to the Pantheon dev environment. So if you merge a pull request, or if you push directly to the master branch, that's going to trigger one of these uh, GitHub action workflows to uh, kick off and, and deploy up to dev. And then we also have, as you saw in the filters here, uh, additional workflows for deploying to the test and the live environments. Uh, and the difference between those and deploying to dev or multi-dev is in those cases, we've already deployed the code to the dev environment. Uh, and so all we need to do is tell Pantheon uh, using Terminus, hey, uh, we want you to deploy the dev environment to the test environment. And then we want you to deploy the test environment to the live environment. Um, so nice and easy. I suspect I'm running out of time. So I'm going to hop over to the code here so you can see how, how this is implemented. Um, and it uses YAML. And so these are files that you stick in a, a specially named directory in your repository. Uh, and I'll put a link to, uh, to the repository that I'm using here um, so you can poke around a little more later. Um, but basically, uh, yeah, you just you set up all the steps in here. Um, so we say uh, for, actually, let's go to the dev one. That's a little more interesting. So for deploy to dev, we say uh, on a push to the main branch, run this workflow. So it's the condition under which this workflow would run uh, automatically. Uh, we set some environment variables, uh, and then uh, we define our jobs. So the jobs, as we saw before, was the Drupal coding standards, and then one called deploy to Pantheon dev. Uh, and this all runs on GitHub Actions uh, runners. Um, so you don't need to use uh, Docker um, you know, or any kind of virtualized container. Uh, although it does support that, and that can be a way to get a little more performance out of this. Uh, but the nice thing is it's pretty simple to set up, uh, and you can use these existing actions uh, from the GitHub's marketplace. Um, and so we're using a few of those here. So we're using actions checkout. We're using one called setup PHP uh, that ensures that uh, any PHP that's run later is using the correct version, and you can configure it with extensions that you need, things like that. Uh, composers built in, so we use uh, Composer, and uh, yeah, so then there's some caching, so you can cache the Composer dependencies, which is handy. That helps these uh, workflows run much more quickly, because um, as you may know, you know, running a Composer install can, can take some time. So if there's no change to the Composer.json uh, file, or the, rather the Composer.lock file, um, then we basically don't have to run Composer install, and GitHub Actions will actually track all the, all the work that was done there already, and we just get to reuse that very quickly. OK. Now I know I'm almost out of time. So um, 
Just a few more things of, of note. So we're running composer install. We're placing an SSH key, um, and we place our secrets uh, in the UI uh, of, of GitHub. Um, so the SSH key is not in the repository. Um, in this case, my repository is public, so that would be a very bad idea. Um, but the SSH key is available to our script here. Um, and then we install Terminus for Pantheon. And then we run a few commands to prepare the code for deployment. Um, so we do some git setup. We remove uh, artifacts uh, from git that we don't need to bother deploying up to Pantheon. Um, and then in a kind of sort of dirty way, uh, we just add all the files um, uh, in the git repository. And then we commit them all, and we, we send it up to Pantheon. <laughs> Um, we're also running, enabling maintenance mode. Um, uh, we clone the database and files from whatever environment we want to do here. Uh, and then we, uh, just a final note at the bottom here is uh, for, uh, basically once you do a git push up to Pantheon, there's no good way to know when the code has actually finished syncing to that Pantheon environment. Um, so. Ideally, it would be great to be able to run our post-deployment Drush commands, you know, things like database updates, importing configuration, and disabling maintenance mode uh, using GitHub Actions. But we, it, it's too risky to just start running those um, because the code might not have synced yet. And so we use Pantheon's Quicksilver scripting, uh, which would be a, another lightning talk, <laughs> uh, to make sure that those commands run uh, after we do a git push. All right, so I know my time's up, so I'm gonna gonna stop there. But I will uh, take any questions. Is there maybe a terminus command that has like a terminus status or some kind of like you could do like a a, a loop on a check like to check if the code was there or not? Yeah, it's a good question. There is a terminus command for um, looking at the workflow status on Pantheon. So that's th things like this. However. There's no way to be sure that the workflow status that you are viewing is related to uh, the deployment that you're doing. Um, so if, if you're working on a team, for example, it could be that somebody else has triggered some workflow. Um, so there's no, there's no identifier or way to very concretely tie it. Uh, and it would, be, uh, it would be kind of, it would be pretty inconvenient to devise the, the code to, to track that reliably. Um, so I, yeah, I talked to Pantheon support about it, and there's just not a, <laughs> it's not really a good way. Um, cool. Yeah, but th that would be nice. Dave, if you have a question, I've handed you to Mike. Hmm. That's not working. Uh, let me try Neeraj just for. You're on, Neeraj. Uh, can you can you hear me? Yes. Hi, uh, so is, uh, I've used, uh, it's called Travis CI with uh, GitHub. I have to, I had to pay Travis CI to integrate with GitHub to uh, run this uh, deployment process. So does that mean with this config that you have, we don't have to pay any, any, anyone to run this deployment and, and uh, this process, right? Yeah, so you, know, you can use something like Travis CI or CodeShip or, or you know any of these other uh, CI tools out there. Um, uh, GitHub Actions is very much like those. It just happens to be built into GitHub, uh, and they have a free tier, which is fairly generous. Um, you know, would be fine for a personal site or something like that. Um, but for more involved, you need more minutes, uh, you know, more more builds, stuff like that. Uh, then then you'd want to pay. Um, but it, it, yeah, the, I think the advantage is there's just a single platform place to log in, and it kind of ties together very easily. Um, but GitHub Actions itself, I don't believe, does things significantly differently than the other CI tools out there. Um, although I do very much like that it is, um, you can set it up without having to kind of worry about virtualization, containers, stuff like that. But you do have to pay for the multi-dev sites, right? Uh, well, yeah, multi-dev with Pantheon is, is a, a something you have to pay for uh, with a, a proper plan or have a uh, supporting organization that uh, provides that as a, as a benefit. Right. Uh, but also, just to point out this the question, the person that asked, it, GitHub Actions replaces the need to use Travis or Circle. And so it's very 
nice because <laughs> it's directly integrated with your get with the, and it has way more features. Travis is relatively basic. Yeah, so I I, I devised this kind of system with GitHub Actions um, based on a client need and. Uh, uh, I, I initially tried to do it with CodeShip, and I, it just was so much more difficult. It was a lot harder to, to get it working properly. Um, so that's why I ended up going the GitHub Actions route. And I, I like it because it's fairly simple. Um, and what you saw like in, in the code there that I had is actually more complex than it needs to be. Um, you don't have to have this level of caching. You don't have to um, you know, ha have some of these other doodads on here. You can whip up something pretty quickly um, that gets your deployment done. You have another question. Uh, is there a way to make it work with Acquia? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, no reason you couldn't do this with Acquia. Um, <coughs> Acquia, you know, has uh, Drush. You can run Drush commands against Acquia. Uh, they've got special Acquia commands to do deployments on Acquia. Um, yeah, should should be pretty straightforward. Assume anything, any system with an API and commands. Um, yeah, it's just running the scripts, whatever the shell scripts are in the actions file. So that's cool. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah, we're still having technical difficulty with uh, uh, Dave Kopesik. Uh, I'm asking uh, for the question in chat. Um. Meanwhile, if I may ask one question here, um, is there a reason you're um, in the in your uh, sorry in your workflow files you are locking to a particular commit hash? Ah. Good, good question and very astute observation, Hussein. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, the GitHub Actions documentation notes um, that for security hardening, security best practices, uh, you should uh, lock the GitHub Actions from the marketplace that you're using to a specific uh, SHA-1 hash. Uh, the reason for that being is uh, it's possible that um, a, a GitHub Action could be uh, modified either by the creator or by a bad actor who is hacked into that creator's account, uh, and they can change uh, what a tag points to. So if you were using version 2.5 of some uh, GitHub action, for example, uh, it's possible that version 2.5 could change and suddenly do bad things um, if yeah. you're not tied to the, the SHA-1 associated with that release. Do you notice any performance issues then? Because I've seen sometimes, you know, if, if when... Um uh, referring to a commit hash, it builds the action rather than uh, using like a pre-built Docker image or something like that. Mm -hmm. GitHub Actions they themselves are implemented as, at least some of them are implemented as Docker images, right? So uh, when specifying a commit hash, I see uh, that uh, it takes some time to build occasionally, you know, and... Um, Interesting. Uh, I haven't... Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I haven't noticed any performance issues with the commit hash. Um, uh, it's possible that you know maybe some of the actions I'm using aren't using Docker. Um, also, I think the way that GitHub Actions caches these things uh, is is that it um, basically when the Docker image is spun up, uh, it gets hashed and cached. Um, hmm. So it, it could be maybe the version of the Docker image changes or, or something like that. I yeah. doubt that it's specific to using the SHA-1 hash, but I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hey, I think I made it to the stage here. We've been trying. Um, oh. <laughs> yeah. So at the beginning, I think you said that um, you know that you you only had composer JSON and composer lock uh, committed to your repo, right? And then did you do something in that composer install that then it, you looked like you added it and then you committed that in that way at the end? I think because because you have to push everything up to uh, Pantheon. Right. Yeah, yeah. So maybe the, the piece that I neglected to mention is uh, there are two Git repositories at play here. There's the one on Pantheon, or the, there's one on GitHub, which is our yeah. canonical you know, main repository. That's where developers are collaborating and you're merging pull requests. And that's the shallow repository that doesn't contain the, the actual binaries and code of your dependencies, um, but just the references to them in the composer.json and composer.lock files. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the Pantheon repository uh, is where we are, uh, after we do the Composer install, we're then committing those to that repository, basically, and pushing that up to Pantheon. So the repository in Pantheon has a vendor directory that's populated, has all the contrib modules built and, and on Pantheon. Um, and Pantheon recently added the ability, I think it's in beta right now for Drupal 9, 
um, to run composer builds on Pantheon. I haven't played around with that yet, um, but personally, uh, I would much rather use a, a more fully featured CI tool like GitHub Actions because it provides a lot more control, um, and you can you can do other things. So you were, I mean, you literally created that. You know, you, you you built it, and then when you did the Git push main or whatever, you know, the that was that was a different repo altogether that you would just well, sort of create it on the fly. Yes, yeah, uh, sort of. <laughs> So there, in the script, he had a git r. He removed the git directory. I did. I did. Oh, oh okay. Removed the git directory. He adds everything and he commits it and he pushes it. Awesome. Okay. Just that, do it. Like all of them, there. Nothing's ignored, right? Yeah. yeah. So that that, I, that um that speaks to the kind of the, the dirtiness of the solution. Um, but I mean, there's I'm nothing wrong with it. I'm looking for a dirty solution. That's, that's that's hard hard to yeah. There's nothing wrong with it. I'm not, you know, I'm basically working in kind of a temporary copy of clone of the repository from GitHub, and so I can do whatever I want there. And then when I push it up to Pantheon, um, I'm actually just doing a, I'm just pushing um, the, I guess the tip of the branch mm -hmm. uh, or the, the head up to Pantheon. Uh, I'm not pushing any history. Um, so in my Pantheon dashboard uh, for the, the dev environment, it actually only shows a single commit. Um, and I'm, I'm doing a git, a git, a git push. <laughs> so is that is that some place where we can see it? Those scripts or are they? Yes, yes. I'll I'll post a link in here. Oh, they're they're just for my my I mean, Drupal nine version of my personal website that hasn't launched so, yet. <laughs> so does the git push still trigger like the the, the the thing, even though it has the one commit? What, what was that? Like you said, dev environment only has one commit. Yeah, because every time I push it up, I'm I'm doing a a force push. And I'm just pushing. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm so that still triggers the time to deploy. I'm sorry. It still triggers the deploy because of that. It does. If you're doing yep. a force push. Okay. Cool. Yeah. And I can yeah, attest so to that. that it's not something you'd ever want to do on a repository that you care about, kind of maintaining a history for. But because we're using GitHub as our main repository, our canonical repository, yeah, we're just yes. using Pantheon for deploying. No problem. <laughs> hmm. That's cool. I guess you just have to re take responsibility for the rollback on on your end, right? Like, it, like you you wouldn't see the history on. Uh, I don't I don't know how that would really work. Yeah. So yeah, if you wanted to roll back on the dev environment on Pantheon, um, you could do it. You can have backups on the dev environment and roll those back. Um, but there's not much point to doing that. On um, dev, at least, right? Yeah. So yeah, you, still, not, you, tag, you still push a tag to, to go live? Yeah. So, so deploying to test in live still uses, you know, tagging the commits. Um, and I, I tested, and there's no there's no negative effect to doing the git push force <laughs> on the live site <laughs> um, or anything like that. I, I'm not sure exactly how Pantheon handles that, but uh, it, it works. Wait, do you push force um, over the tag? No, I don't. I just get. Uh, do the push force to the the master branch on Pantheon? Oh right, but that's not to live. You and said then Pantheon to live. takes care of the the tagging and deployments when I run the terminus commands. Cool, clever. Well, thanks for your questions. It was very uh, cool. Thank you. And uh, I'll I'll yield yield back to the host, who is me. <laughs> uh, Pulling. Pulling's there. Hi, I'm here. What what do we need to do? Sorry, walk me through this. Do I end the session or? Um, no, we've got some closing remarks. Um, you, do you have the deck up? Do you want to do that? I'll, I'll do that. Excellent. Thank you. Our next meetup, now you can hear me, <laughs> is uh, Wednesday, December 2nd. Um, and we don't have a link for RSVPing yet. Uh, we're skipping our November meetup because it's uh, less than a week before, uh, or a week, just a week before Drupal Camp NYC. And <laughs> we want to focus our efforts there. Um, so join us at uh, Drupal Camp uh, NYC and then come back uh, the first Wednesday of December. Um, and if you're not already on our mailing list, uh, these are new, and this is our, our main way of communicating out. Um, 
you know about our meetups and, and about camps and other things, you can choose what emails you receive. Uh, you can go to bit.ly slash DNYC dash mailing dash lists. Catchy. All right, so we'll mosey on along. And uh, tentatively, our, uh, our next meetup talks, uh, we're going to hear from Eric Saad about configuration management. And we're going to hear from Jacob Rockowitz uh, about something hopefully interesting. <laughs> we don't know what yet. Um, and we also have some talks lined up for January. Um, and yeah, we can move on to the next slide here. Um, if you want to talk at uh, speak at one of our meetups, we'd love to have you, uh, especially if you've never done so before. That is uh, especially interesting for us. We love to hear from from new speakers, uh, and we will help you if if you have any concerns about speaking, if it's not your thing, if you don't know how or don't know what to speak on. Um, so let us know. Speak at DrupalNYC.org. Hooray! We made it. <laughs> uh, despite many many technical difficulties with AirMeet, uh, thanks for bearing with us. Um, so Ho Ling is going to figure out how to end the session, and when she does that, um, we're going to get kicked back over to the uh, the networking lounge, uh, where you can sit down at a table and uh, uh, say hello to, to people um, and decide what you want to to talk about uh, during happy hour. So thanks everyone for coming, and uh, we hope to see you at, at Drupal Camp NYC, November twelve to fourteen, and. Then again on December 2nd. All right, see you. Thanks, Sadie.